Hello, everybody. Um, it's lovely to see people here in person and um, in the virtual world. I'm Sally Robinson. I'm the theme lead for Better Communities, and I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Daryl Selwood and Ellen Fraser Barber, my colleagues uh, who are part of Better Communities and part of the Caring Futures Institute and part of Flinders University. We're going to talk to you today uh, and talk with each other about co-design. Um, I'm going to preface our conversation by saying that, and you can see in the title of our presentation, we've said, how can we realize the potential for transformation? The reason for that is that we're really aware of where we're at with the Caring Futures Institute, that it's a new institute. Um, it's in its infancy, it's in its startup phase. We know that there are people um, in the CFI who are doing good, interesting work in their projects. Um, but we don't want to overclaim what we're doing. Um, it's generative work. Uh, and what we want to do today is to have a conversation, and when we had our uh, preparatory conversation together, we talked about how we might ask some provocative questions um, to problematize what co-design might do in our institute, um, uh, but how we might use co-design and co-production as a way of digging deeper, uh, finding richer ways of being together and doing things together that might um, make being part of the CFI more interesting for the people who work in it, the people who take part in it, and the people who um, find out things as a result of the research that we do together. Just very briefly touching on some of the things that you see uh, in definitions around co-design, you can see that we've got a bit of a way to go. Uh, when you look at some of the definitions that we have, to be honest, they're slightly constipated, um, if you'll forgive the expression. Um, co-design, when you look at it out of the community sector, it talks about the combination of lived experience that people um, uh, bring because of their lived experience and people bring because of their professional expertise. When you start to look from research, about research co-design, language starts to get very formal um, and it's about participation in explicitly described, defined and auditable roles. It doesn't sound very much fun. It doesn't sound very creative. It doesn't sound very generative or very exciting. And then when you look to the key principles of co-design, what sits underneath that, you see all of this really good stuff that you really want to be part of about co-design being inclusive and it being mutual and reciprocal and about respect and participative process and about being empowering and enabling for people. It being iterative, the cycles where people are in repeated conversation and dialogue with each other. It being flexible and it being focused on the outcomes that people can get from all of those good things that they do together that are enriching for people in their work. So who wouldn't want to be part of that? Um, the challenges, though, for us are how we get that to happen uh, in the context in which we're working. How we get that to have meaning in a college where we're working across disciplines. People do very diverse kinds of work in all kinds of ways. Um, how we can hold meaning across the individual projects that we're doing, where people do um, work with children who experience abuse, children with disability who experience abuse, and cardiac care research in clinical contexts. How we, we bring co-design in meaning across all of that great diversity in robotics, uh, in, in all kinds of different things. How we make sure that in those individual projects, co-design has meaning but also at a governance level for an institute, we have co-design have meaning in ways that aren't tokenistic. That co-design has an evidence base sitting underneath it because this is about research co-design uh, and how it's really grounded in the lived experience of people who are really fundamental to the work of the CFI. So my job today is to not talk too much, so I want to just quickly tell you about the approach that we're taking. Basically what we're doing is to hasten slowly, um, to not leap in and say here's the model of co-design that applies to the CFI. 
We're doing a survey. Um, this sounds now, here comes my shyster recruitment pitch. The survey's coming out to you guys uh, who work in the CFI very shortly um, uh, to build the knowledge base, to find out what is it that we're doing around co-design so that we can build something that responds to the need, um, but also the strength of what we're already doing. Um, to invite contribution um, from researchers, but also from the communities who we're already working with and the communities that we want to invite more engagement with. And from that, build a model that responds to our needs and our skills. And there's a working group of people you can see there who are already part of, the, of doing that job together. So that's the, um, the, the introductory spiel. Now I want to move to the part of the conversation that's going to be far more interesting for you, uh, which is the discussion with my colleagues, um, Ellen and Daryl. Um, what we're going to do is to ask um, a series of questions um, uh, to, to Ellen and Daryl, um, and uh, they're going to talk from their experience as researchers uh, and as people who bring lived experience as well um, uh, to, to these questions. Um, so if I could start, um, Daryl, I think we're going to start with you. Um, this is a bit where I get to sit down and just relax now. Um, uh, Daryl, some of the themes that we saw in Tom's presentation, Tom Shakespeare's presentation, seemed especially relevant to co-design. Um, and I wonder whether there were particular things that resonated for you or really stood out. Tom Shakespeare talked about the reciprocity that has been developed in the care relationship through the paid personal assistant role. Is it possible to apply this principle in co-design? How do we address the power differential between researchers and the people being researched? He also pointed out that not all research needs to be co-designed. If we're going to do it, we need to invest the time and energy and resources to do it well. We need to make the effort to build trust and allow the time to listen. Ideally, we want the people in the cohort that we're researching to be in the driver's seat wherever possible. And the actual requirements will change between projects. It can seem overwhelming. And it's tempting to say it's too hard, and we don't have time, or resources to do it. Or we don't want to be tokenistic about it, so we just won't bother. I think our research will find that there are many ways of doing co-design effectively. That there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all model. I'm excited to find out what people in the CFI are doing already that works and to learn from each other's mistakes. Thank you, Daryl. Um, I really um, resonated for me as well what Tom had to say about relationships um, and the importance of relationships. And yeah. it made me think about investment in co-design uh, and how that grows over time uh, and how you learn more deeply from people as you sit with them over time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Ellen, I wonder if we could ask you to talk with us about jargon uh, and co-design because it's one of those, it, as itself it's a term that really uh, is almost in danger of becoming a piece of jargon, isn't it? Uh, and um, we're almost losing the shared meaning in the term co-design. Um, and I wonder if there are, within the idea of co-design, whether there are particular terms or, or practices that you think should come with red flags on them, uh, that there are things that have a higher risk of tokenism or, or a lack of ethical practice around them. Yeah, I think that um, in the same way that academia has um, previously been quite dominated by white, middle-class, able um, people, I think that has made it really difficult for us to um, check and recognise issues around ableism, racism, um, gender issues as well. And so that means that there are a number of red flags that come up in terms of um, the everyday nature of discrimination that we experience. Um, and so I think when we invite people 
into project and we try to do co-design, one of the red flags is that sometimes we can um, reinforce marginalisation when we don't pay people for their work. And there's a lot of emotional labour that goes into that work when you live with a disability or you are someone that experiences racism or sexism or whatever that is. Um, so I think there's that kind of risk there when we, as people of privilege, come in and try and invite other people to the table. Um, and that's not to say that we shouldn't invite those people. It's more just that we need to be aware of those power dynamics that are always at play when we are doing that research. Mm. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah. Daryl, um, I mentioned just before that there uh, were many different approaches to research in play across the Caring Futures Institute. Uh, have you got ideas about how we can bring different paradigms and approaches into a productive tension uh, when we're thinking about co-design? Mm. Yes, Sally, it is important to realise that throughout the CFI there's a great diversity in the type of people and communities we research. While we're talking today from the perspective of people with disabilities, the Institute is currently involved in researching a great diversity of areas with a wide variety of different people. And this is going to lead to both the opportunity and the need for different ways of approaching co-design. As we know, what works for one group may not resonate so well for another. Some researchers have had co-design strongly embedded in their methodology for a long time. Yet, for other researchers in the CFI, this could be very new. This introduces a productive tension. How can we work toward best practice while ensuring those who are new to research co-design are supported? Another tension is, as Tom suggested, the need to allow extra time and resources to listen and develop trust versus the pressure of producing research outcomes quickly and with limited finance. This can be challenging, no matter the kind of community we are working with. Yet, the take-home message for me from Tom's presentation is that, although there are challenges and tensions, the benefits in terms of the quality of research data revealed far outweigh the costs of incorporating co-design into our research practice. Thanks, Daryl. I guess you're seeing quite a lot of different <clears throat> examples sitting in the research hub at the moment, um, uh, surrounded by all different kinds of researchers. Um, Ellen, I wonder if we might turn to a slightly different topic with you, um, which is about the sort of principles and practices that um, you think we need to underpin co-design to really see it walk the talk, um, both um, from your perspective as a researcher doing your PhD um, and as a person with disability. Um, I think there's a number. I think the main thing is that there is no one size fits all. And as Tom has said, and as everyone keeps saying, relationships are the most important thing. And so being able to take our guidance from the people that we are working with is really important. That's in terms of the research agenda that we set, the kind of questions that we ask, but also from the, method the methodology, the ethics, that involving them in every stage of the research, but not just as participants, which kind of suggests to me um, it's a bit of a transactional relationship. Um, I would suggest that we would call them colleagues or um, people that are more equal. Um, and I would like to see in co-design um, more, more leadership by people who do experience marginalisation, whether that be because they have a disability or um, they experience racism, you know, to actually give power to those people and to say, you know, what's your experience been? You have expertise in this area. Let's use it. Let's capitalise on it. Mm. 
I think there's something really important in what you're saying there about the way that power is um, redistributed. Um, thank you, Ellen. Uh, I know that time is ticking on, so um, I wonder if um, both of you might like to comment about uh, whether, for people who are listening who want to improve their practice in co-design, whether you have any takeaway messages to leave people with. Daryl, would you like to go first? Um, um, uh, 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 how, uh, how, you to look at what do other people do in this space. They also have courage to come up with new ideas. With the people that you are researching. And engaging with them. To come up with new ideas, new ways. To generate new knowledge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I really like the idea of communities of practice and um, ways to bring in people um, who are, uh, you, you might otherwise not find out things from. Um, uh, so it's something that I think we should be looking at definitely. Um, uh, and looking at who's part of those communities of practice who we wouldn't necessarily come across in our day-to-day -day practice. Yeah. Um, thanks, Daryl. Um, uh, Ellen, have you got um, things you'd like to leave people with? Um, I would say that we can always learn from mistakes and we shouldn't shy away from making those mistakes and it's okay to feel uncomfortable and to work towards that rather than to avoid those conversations altogether. Um, I think that in co-design there will always be difficult, um, messy relationships and power dynamics and things that are at play all the time. Um, and so rather than pretending it's not there, I think it's really important that we actually acknowledge that and then work out a way to go forward and how we actually work together with people. Ah, so sit with discomforts and work through them. Yeah, I think that's great advice, thank you. Um, I don't know how we're going for time. Do we have time to look at the Slido? Um, uh, we've got two questions here. It's up to you guys which ones we choose. Language is important. What is the best way to involve and talk about the contributions of people with lived experience in the research process? And how do we know if we've been successful in implementing co-design effectively in our research? Ellen, is there one of those that you'd like to pick up? Or? Um, yeah, what was the first one? Would you mind Language that? is important. What is the best way to involve and talk about the contributions of people with lived experience in the research process? Yeah, I think language is a really um, complicated one and it's one that I think we just always need to keep checking back on with people that we're working with because for each person, um, they will have different preferences around language. Um, but in terms of actually making sure that people are 
part of that process, it's about paying for people and referring to them as colleagues, as friends, as um, co-workers, you know, as people that work alongside us and live alongside us. Um, often we, we, we tend to talk about people with disability as those people over there. And I find that really challenging. So it's about those relationships again. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Do you mind if I pick up the other one? Is that all right? Um, uh, I think how we know that we've implemented co-design well is that we don't drop it um, after the beginning of the design process. Tom um, uh, made a distinction between co-design and co-production that I think is really helpful. The Brits do this really nicely. Uh, but, and they think of co-design as the initial part of the co-production process and that co-production flows through the whole uh, part of the service design or the, the research design um, uh, um, process and so I think we know that co-design is working really well uh, because people will tell us because they're embedded in the research process so they've been part of, of it from the beginning through all of the stages through to the knowledge translation or the knowledge exchange stage so we'll know if we've stuffed it up because people are there right alongside us and they'll let us know um, so um, hopefully we'll know because people are there with us along for the ride. Uh, I think we're out of time, so thank you so much uh, to uh, Ellen Fraser Barber and to Dr. Daryl Selwood for an uh, outstanding performance.